Um, so Chris and I must have been in the same kind of zone when we were designing our talks because I, I decided rather than try to give you a complete overview of an area that I would just simply paint a couple of vignettes. One about an accomplishment that, that I think changed things significantly that you can attribute to computer science and then a little bit about where I think uh, the game is going going forward. Um, so I'm going to come from the other direction. I think Chris was really kind of coming from the system downward. I'm actually interested in fundamental science. I actually want to go from the, you know, the individual constituents of a cell up. So I want to understand how that brain works, okay, as a collection of individual neurons. Um, so we're going to zoom in on life, and I thought I'd start by saying that yes, we can, okay, and show you a couple of examples of, uh, of things that are zoomed in. This is a uh, the first uh, cellular division in the development of a small worm called C. elegans, a classic model system. And you're looking at different components. You're looking at the centrosomes, which are these uh, white things on, the, uh, on your uh, right, um, which are basically pulling apart the DNA. Uh, in, the, in the picture at the top left, you're looking at actually growing microtubule fibers. And at the bottom, you're looking at a two-color image where you're seeing two genes that are critical in establishing the polarity of the cell. In other words, the, the worm needs to know where its head's going to be and where its tail's going to be. Okay? And you can clearly see that these genes are creating a gradient for you. Um, so the important thing about these, though, is that these images weren't possible 15 years ago. And what makes them possible is that today we can actually directly go into the genome of this worm and modify it so that the relevant proteins are going to glow with this jellyfish protein, with this green fluorescent protein. So until we had the genomic sequence of this worm, we couldn't do this stuff. Okay? But we can now. So I'll come back to this story in a moment. But I thought I'd go ahead and for my first story, I'd go backwards in time to the beginning of all of this, which really was the Human Genome Project. Um, and um, I'm going to pick it up in 96, where, where I, I was fortunate enough to have a, a role. So basically, with a very good um, classic geneticist, Jim Weber, at the Marshfield Clinic, um, together we proposed that maybe we could do the genome faster if we uh, used a fairly radical protocol. And so Jim and I kind of worked out the protocol. I did extensive simulation work that showed under certain what I thought were reasonable assumptions that you could, you could accomplish this computation. And, and basically what we did is we turned this, we, instead of the, the way it was going in the public sector was that they were going to do the conservative thing, which is that they felt that the biggest kind of sequencing puzzle, informatics puzzle that they could solve involved a thousand pieces, right? So you guys are used to using a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle. So their scheme involved solving 50,000 1,000 piece puzzles. And what basically Jim and I said is, no, one 50 million piece puzzle, and it can be done, okay? And this was pretty radical at the time. This is kind of the reaction we got, okay? The uh, critics said it wouldn't work, and there were a lot of critics, okay? One of the classic quotes was that we would produce the Swiss, Swiss cheese genome, which meant that it was going to be full of holes and very incomplete. It was kind of a... A nice, uh, it was clever. Um, so anyway, and I, I, I was actually, it was kind of funny because I'm usually a pretty thin-skinned guy and this kind of stuff hurts, but it actually excited me because I, because I knew that something was, you know, I knew, I knew that, that, that this was actually had a reasonable chance and that what I was, what I was getting was interesting sociology, actually. Uh, so, uh, and, and actually this idea almost died on the vine, actually. So, and I, that's another story you can ask me about, but I was lucky enough that in 1998, Perk and Elmer, because they were actually losing market share to Amersham on the next generation of sequencing instruments, decided to form Solera, okay? And basically, this, the schema was we were going to do this whole genome shotgun thing, okay, with Craig as, the, uh, as our fearless leader, and he was a great leader. And so, in 1999, we built this factory, which, you know, when I showed this back in 1999, people were quite awed by it. You guys are probably looking at it now and saying how quaint, okay? But it was, hey, it was a big deal, okay, 10 years ago. It was like, you know, it was a city block, you know, it was like 300 machines. We were using incredible amounts of energy. Um, it was a big deal. And we put it together in a year's time frame. And so we could actually produce those 50 million pieces. And basically what happened is, is that in 2001, we actually tied with the public project on the human genome. 
But the thing that you have to consider is, is that in exactly the same time frame, you have to remember that we went from nothing. I, I arrived in 1998 in a building with a rented piece of furniture and eight other people kind of going, where are the phones? Okay. From 1998, by 2001, we had not only tied on the human genome, but we had also sequenced the fruit fly, the mouse, and the mosquito, okay, which are all susceptible genomes by the end of 2001. And the, 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 more, the, the, the point of the story, I hope I'm not being too forceful, but basically all genomes are done this way now and have been ever since because of the economies of scale of the approach. So in other words, that what happens is we, we, we replaced a huge amount of physical work and machinery and instrumentation in exchange for difficult computation. That was the trade-off. And, you know, and the computation obviously worked. So, you know, just to make the point forcefully, computer science served a critical enabling role. It, 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 uh, it, you know, I was involved in the design of the protocol with Jim. That was a collaboration. And um, it was involved a solution to a daunting problem that, that probably only someone with our kinds of training would have, would have considered to be uh, uh, plausible. Um, so, um, so now we move to 2009, and you see a couple of boxes there. One's by a company called 454, the other one's by a company called Selexa. And these boxes, one of these boxes, equals the entire picture I showed you. <laughs> okay? So we're obviously going faster than Moore's Law in terms of sequencing capacity. Okay? Um, there are actually new interesting characteristics to this data. So even though I, I, you know, we did a pretty good job with the methods, there's still a lot of, of, of new challenges. And it really, you know, I, I've actually personally never been a fan of supercomputing. I mean, I've always been the kind of guy where like, yeah, I can make the code so fast, I don't need those big machines, okay? But frankly, at this point, we need the big machines, okay? Even, even I am saying that, okay? And I've been, I'm, I'm an admitted skeptic, okay? We need the big machines, we're, we're drowning at this point, we're really drowning. Um, Okay. I mean, and the, the other thing, if you think about it, is, is that the informatics now is, I mean, I'm going to state it more strongly than Chris, the informatics is the bottleneck, okay? Because if you think about it, at Solera, we had 80 people running that factory, and we had 15 informaticians, right, doing the, you know, our piece of it, right? Now we've got this one machine that you can, you know, have running in your lab locally at your university for a half a million dollars. And, but you can't have your 15 informaticians, okay, and there is no, you know, plug and play piece of software for this. I mean, it's a real problem. I mean, people are like coming to me all the time and I, I, I fortunately I can say, well, I'm doing something else now, but, you know. <laughs> so, so what do I think is next? So here, here are kind of the obvious things, right, and other people have talked about them. So there's the next, next gen sequencers, okay, so your genome for a thousand bucks. That's going to be pretty cool. Because once you have your genome, then you can really, it's really just a simply matter of making associations between what is your genome and what happens to you physically. Who are you physically in terms of diabetes, longevity, blah, 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 blah. And all we have to really do is make the correlations, right? So the game plan is clear. And it may well happen with one of these social networks, I don't know, or through the, in fact, in fact I think the biggest problem with this is actually getting a good characterization of your phenotype. In other words, it's not getting your genome. That information's accurate. It's really understanding what is your blood pressure through the day. What is your blood sugar? Okay, these are the real, the real issues there. Um, you know, the other obvious thing, okay, which some of my colleagues are going to, is, is we sequence everything, okay? And this is actually really important, too, because it answers key questions in diversity, in evolution. I mean, there's still a lot of very interesting questions in terms of how do these complex systems evolve, okay? So we're, we've got a lot more work to do. Darwin started it, but there's a lot more to figure out. I mean, cancer is just a form of evolution, if you think about it, just a little faster than one would desire. Okay, and, path, you know, and then pathogenicity, I mean, how do the microbes get around? How do they become pathogenetic? How do we get plagues? I mean, all of these questions will be answered by our tremendous capacity to sequence things. And of course, now that we can, we can, we know how to, we know what the genomes look like, we can also generate sequences, all right, which is in and of itself very interesting. So all of these involved huge amounts of data, okay, and all of them, um, the computation and analysis are the bottlenecks. Okay, it really, it's really shifting rather dramatically. But I'm going to tell you, so those are all things that I think are predictable. As a, as a researcher, I'm always looking for an edge, okay? So I'm going to tell you what my view is, okay, where uh, we're going a little bit differently. 
Okay. So in my view, the most significant outcome of these genome projects, okay, is that it actually permits us to manipulate the genomes. Okay. So I said that earlier. Okay. I mean, it's we didn't, pr we didn't produce the blueprint of life, okay? That was PR stuff, okay? You didn't get a blueprint. What we got was we got the sequence, which contained all the information, but we don't understand all the information that's there, okay? And there was no way we were going to. But nobody can argue that it wasn't incredibly useful, because now we can go in there and we can manipulate everything. We can take every gene and turn it off. We can take every gene and we can overexpress it. We can take every gene and we can light it up by adding this fluorescent protein or several of them. We can take every thing that controls whether a gene is on or not and put it in front of fluorescence, right? So now we have the ability to manipulate an organism at a scale that we've never had before. And I think that that is the real power of this deal, okay? And so it enables systems genetics. So there are three examples. I think in the interest of time, I'm just going to say that there are examples of this. This is not Okay, it's not just my fantasy, okay, it's actually happening. There are other colleagues of mine who have actually done some of these on some scales. We're obviously not going to do this on human beings, but we're doing it on worms, we're doing it on flies, and because it's expensive, we're starting to do it on mice, and eventually we, we will be able to do it on mice, okay? And we'll learn a tremendous amount. You, you're just small, little, you know, we're just big mice, okay? Really. Okay, so, and, but the thing that's really interesting is all the readouts, if you really look at it, all the, almost all the interesting readouts from this data, all the high dimensional data, is imagery. It's microscopy. It's either EM microscopy or light microscopy. All the outputs, okay, all the really interesting outputs, in my opinion, are imaging. So I'm actually a sequence guy. I'm, a com I'm what co it's called a, originally a combinatorial mathematician, but I'm trying to be a vision guy now because I'm just, I'm following, I'm following the ball. And so I have to be a vision guy now, and I, I'm not sure how good I am, but I'm, I'm going to be good, okay, because I want to go there. So this is an example of an intracellular process. What you're looking at is those centrosomes through the first four divisions of the cell, and you can see we've managed to track them. And the interesting thing is we've actually been able to answer a very interesting question about the biophysics of the centrosome that we couldn't answer before. Here's a worm. Here's that little worm I was talking about, except now it's all grown up, okay? And there's about 550 cells there. And we've stained it with a variety of reagents that I won't detail. But the point of the matter is, is that we've, you know, this is kind of one of our earlier projects. We've gotten good enough that we can straighten, first we straighten that worm out. Notice we made it straight. It doesn't cooperate. It's squiggly under the scope. We straighten it out. We can do segmentation, registration, the things that Chris talked about, see all the cells. Not only that, we can actually name all the cells. So it's kind of like constellations in the sky. We've learned how to recognize the Big Dipper. We actually know the individual identity of all of the cells. Okay, so using actually AI techniques. Okay, um, so finally, um, the last thing is we're very interested at Genalia in brains. How much time do I have? Two minutes. I got two. All right. So. So this, 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 is a, this is the brain of a fly. A fly does pretty complicated things. I mean, a fly flies, okay, it walks, it mates, it makes decisions about what to eat and what not to eat. You can actually Pavlovian condition a fly if you work really hard, <laughs> okay? Um, so it's, about, it's got about 100,000 neurons, okay? And so the current state of neurology is, is that we understand how individual neurons work and transmit signals. But if you ask a neurobiologist, how does the fly do what it does, he says, well, I don't know, because I don't know what the circuit is. And so basically what we're at about at Genalia is trying to determine the circuit. So it is now, at this time, because of the Genome Project and the things that we have, we believe technologically feasible, okay, to determine the complete interactivity at the neuronal level of this circuit. So, um, you know, so here's an example of just a few cells. So you can see that our problem is that we have very poor signals. I wish I had the resolution that, that Chris was showing you. I mean, we're down there at a half micron level of resolution. Things are very noisy. So all our stuff is about SNR. Um, you know, this is just we can, yes, we can, we can trace the things. You can see that. And the hope is, is to actually ultimately be able to build a complete model in which we know where every neuron is and who it talks to. And so we'll have the complete flow of information. It's kind of like the genome project. It's not going to tell you how the fly flies or how it mates, okay? We're still not going to understand exactly what the neurons are doing. But it's going to be an absolute prerequisite, and it's going to accelerate the neurobiology like you've never seen, okay? That's, that's my belief anyway. 
Um, so one last brain, okay, this is to show you that neurons are really, really long in mammalian brains. So this is actually a mouse brain, and I'm just going to zoom out on it, okay, and you can see it's pretty big. We're building, just to give you an idea about volumes, we're building a scope. This is kind of fun, so I'm actually building a scope. It's going to actually image an entire volume in a week, and it'll be 4.2 trillion voxels. So, I mean, I guess those aren't numbers that scare Larry, okay, but I actually have to... This is, for example, a, this is basically 10 micron cube, okay? And this is like 1% of the things, and I'm going to have uh, thousands of those, okay, that I have to trace, and I have to actually see the neuronal projections. So I'll probably get about 100,000 neurons per brain. And so there's actually some hope that I'm going to be able to begin to get at the fine-grained architecture of a mouse's brain, which is a very close proximity to our own. Um, okay, so in conclusion, um, so... I really think that in some sense it's been genomics has been the poster child for high throughput biology and has really been driving it. It's where everybody's seen it. But the point of the matter is, is that molecular biology itself, kind of the bread and butter of it, is now be going into a big, big data mode. Okay, especially with the, even the microscopes are high throughput instruments, thanks to all the great CCD detectors that we have, because everybody wants to take a digital picture. Okay, so we can, so you can see what my agenda is, right? We can map genomes, okay? So I'm just a mapper, just a, just a guy making maps. So I want to make a map of a cell. I want to understand what a cell looks like in terms of const its constituent parts. And I want to make maps of developing organisms. I want to make a map of that brain. Um, computation, again, I'm going to state it really strongly. Computation is the bottleneck. I mean. Uh, there are massive amounts of data, and you have to perform at levels that we currently don't perform at for many of these problems. Um, I'm going to give, I'll, I'll end with one last uh, uh, example, which is we're also trying to do an EM reconstruction of the fly, which is going to be at the level of basically individual synapses. Um, it will take us, we've done, we've done, I can't remember the exact numbers, um, but there are estimates about how long it will take to actually do all of the fine-grained sectioning and EM acquisition. And then there's the amount of time it will take to actually produce the model. Okay, and because the software doesn't do a perfect job, and it's actually already performing at the 99.97% level, but there are so many things involved that, um, you know, that frankly, to do the whole thing, it's going to take five times more manpower and time okay, to curate, to run the computations and curate that thing at current performance levels than it will to collect the data. Okay, so hopefully that, that I've, I've asserted it, hopefully that one cinches it. Okay, so I'm, I'm done. Thank you very much.